Okay, well, hello, hey, uh, buenos dias, buenas tardes, everybody. It's uh, me, El Profesor, here, and as I mentioned in the announcement, uh, I'm not broadcasting from the uh, French Valley Studios. I'm actually uh, here in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm on the uh, ninth floor of the uh, MGM Grand. Uh, as I mentioned in the announcement, I got a chance to see my uh, rock and roll heroes from going way, way back in, in high school, uh, Rush. I mean, those guys have been at it now for uh, 40 years. They're all in their uh, early 60s, but they're uh, still going strong. I don't know how many more tours uh, they, they have left. Uh, uh, the rumors in the uh, rock and roll websites are kind of saying that this might be it for them. So if that's the case, then uh, uh, then this is definitely the, uh, the, the, a good way to, uh, to see them as they... Uh, uh, as they decide to uh, uh, call it quits, but uh, those guys are full of surprises, so I wouldn't be surprised if they sneak in maybe uh, another tour coming up for uh, for next year. All right, well, listen, everybody, uh, I want to go ahead and tell you a little bit about the uh, the final uh, readings for the uh, uh, for for the for the, for the session, and uh, uh, unfortunately, there's, there's no film for this week, uh, uh, but still quite a few of the usual items, the powerpoints, uh, PDFs, and, and of course the usual readings. So without further ado, let me go ahead and get this uh, show on the road. And I apologize if the uh, lighting uh, cuts uh, in and out. Uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, uh, there's no uh, ceiling light that I, I can turn on uh, so you can get a, a better view of me. So uh, uh, so it looks like uh, you'll, you'll see some of the shadow uh, cutting in and out as the video progresses. But as long as the sound is okay, uh, you can hear, hear me just fine. And I don't use the... Uh, I don't lose the YouTube connection. I don't have a situation like the uh, network outage uh, that we had at the uh, that we had at, at the school about a, about a week ago. So let's go ahead and get in, and and get on into it, and let's see what's coming up for uh, for for, uh, for this week. So uh, you know the drill. Every time I have to read, I have to uh, take off my my glasses. Okay. All right. Well, um, the uh, the main topic, or one of the main topics we're looking at, of course, is the cataclysm that is the U.S. Me me uh, U.S. Mexico War. And to illustrate um, uh, to illustrate uh, how these two nations uh, got to this uh, uh, to this point, I want you to go ahead and take a look at the two of the U.S. lecture outlines. That's outlines of 12 and, and 13, and gives you a sense of uh, what's happening in. In, in, in the country leading up to the U.S.-Mexico War, and interestingly, the, the United States, like Mexico, wasn't really uni unified uh, e either. Of course, uh, in Mexico, we're, we're seeing things. We're seeing things where the uh, clashes between the uh, uh, between the liberals, who are called the Federalists, and the conservatives, who are called the Centralists, and the uh, and and the and the infamous uh, Santa Ana. Uh, <clears throat> One of the one of the guys from uh, one of the guys from uh, from, uh, from from Texas, of course, the whole remember the Alamo type of thing. Uh, Santa Ana, in essence, played off of those uh, differences uh, uh, during his, his during his rise to power in the uh, first half first half of the 19th century. But the United States is a little bit different. It was more along the lines of economy and of course uh, and of course society. And slavery was uh, definitely the the, the uh, key issue, which uh, predicated. Uh, Helped to create the political split between between North and South. Of course, uh, slavery was in the news again with the whole Confederate flag issue in South Carolina following the uh, the murders of the uh, nine people who were at that church in in, in Charleston, and uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 you know th uh, that that history ne never never goes away. There's always going to be a, a constant uh, fighting and uh, and haggling over it. And despite the protests of the uh, pro-Confederate flag people saying that it's not uh, it's not slavery, it's heritage, it's this, it's that, blah blah blah, that's not true. It is slavery. Slavery was an issue in and of itself, and and it and also poisoned all the other issues too. And uh, that's touched upon a little bit in outline in outline 13, but in outline 12. Um, we get into a little bit of how the the North was a growing uh, power in terms of uh, agriculture, manufacturing, and communication. Essentially, the North was, uh, you know, much like the uh, uh, the nation now has been. I've seen a lot of rapid changes in technology since the uh, 1990s, uh, of course, uh, into present times, and everything we have today with a uh, uh, with a. Uh, iPhones and iPads and uh, Androids and Galaxies and whatever gadgets are out, out there now, you can make the comparison that in the 1840s, 1830s into the early 1840s, the northern part of the United States was definitely uh, 
definitely had a, a lot of that sense of uh, of change and uh, uh, and, and and rapid a, a advances. As Robert Johansson, one of the historians uh, that I'm sure some of you are going, to, are going to read about for the U.S.-Mexico War assignment, talks about the idea that the United States was considered a go-ahead nation, and the north part of the United States clearly that was definitely the the, the case. Uh, my outline talks a little bit about people like uh, John Deere, Cyrus M M McCormick, Charles Goodyear, and of course those of you who know uh, products, whether it's things such as uh, tires and uh, farm equipment, that's where these the terms came from. There were actual, actual people who were around uh, in the first half of the 19th century. All right, so uh, while the North had the sense of uh, boundless energy, power optimism, the South, on the other hand, saw things a little bit differently. If anything, the southern part of the United States still seemed to maintain more of, uh, I guess you could say, genteel European uh, gentlemanly traditions. Ah, oh, dude, the cliffs, uh, uh, everything is, is fine down, down here in the south, that, that, that type of thing. Uh, <clears throat> I remember when I started teaching uh, these classes, my, uh, my mentor, teacher, Professor Chavez, Victor Chavez, of course, is still there at Southwestern. Uh, Victor used to do a lot of those uh, goofy southern uh, uh, do the clit uh, types of voices. So uh, I used to do that c quite a bit in, uh, when I did the on-campus class. From time to time, uh, I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll do that here for, uh, I'll do that here for, for these classes. Uh, but clearly, the focus in the south was, was more toward an agricultural planter-based society. And cotton was definitely the driving economic engine for for the South. That's where you can get the term the rice of King Cotton. But co cotton is uh, land intensive and labor intensive. You need people to take care of all that stuff. Who's going to do it? It's not going to be the uh, genteel uh, 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 Mr. Beauregard, the, uh, the people who are on the plantation. No, it's going to be the uh, your African-American labor. It's going to be your slaves. So uh, a slave labor is, is definitely necessary for the growth of your for the growth of your economy, and so it's no surprise that by the uh, <clears throat> Um, uh, by the middle parts of the uh, by the early parts of the 1840s, uh, even though it's the United States, clearly there was a lot of divisions between uh, between North and South, and that's what those two outlines outlines 12 and 13 illustrate. Now, after you look at the outlines, I want you to give yourselves a quick overview of the four main roots of the. Uh, idea of manifest destiny. And I've got a PDF uh, uh, file there for you called The Roots of Manifest Destiny. Check that out because that outline uh, draws, essentially draws a straight line from the time of the Puritans all the way to the election of James Polk in 1844. Simply put, put Manifest destiny didn't occur in a vacuum. You didn't get a case where, say, James Polk ran for president in 18, uh, 1844 and said, uh, I'm going to uh, unify the country and, and my Democratic Party with manifest destiny. Let's go take the land uh, for, from all those uh, uh, heathen Indians and those uh, crazy Mexicans ah, and, and all that stuff. No, manifest destiny's roots go, go way back. One can make the case that it was during Andrew Jackson's time when you might say the uh, uh, the presidential politics, the uh, uh, presidential uh, bully type of politics that Andrew Jackson epitomized, uh, which of course Polk uh, took the uh, took the football and ran with it, so to speak. Uh, you can look at Jackson as a root, but also go way way back in time, uh, even to when Thomas Jefferson was was president. Jefferson essentially believed that land was essential for the growth of democratic institutions, liberty, uh, republican government, democracy, all all of all of all of that fun fun stuff. Uh, Jefferson believed land was essential for the growth of, of of that. But if you go back even further in time, you can make the case that things like the uh, like the Protestant Reformation and the time of the Puritans, when the Puritans under uh, uh, under John Winthrop believed that uh, <clears throat> that the New World was like a city on on a hill, a, a beacon of pure spiritual crest, of uh, pure spiritual Christianity for all the world to see. Back in the 1980s, when Ronald Reagan was running for president, and then again 1984 when he won uh, uh, re-election over Walter Mondale, Reagan believed in this idea of a city on a hill, that the United States was a beacon for the rest of the world. Well, Reagan essentially took that from the Puritans and Winthrop. It was those guys back in the 17th century who talked about the idea of the uh, city on a, on a hill. So when you take that idea going back to the time of the Puritans, not surprisingly, others uh, uh, others pick pick it up from there and uh, uh, and add more to it, and that's where we get into a Polk and the election of 1844. Now I add to the story by checking out the article by William Weeks. William Weeks had talks about economy, religion, uh, foreign relations, military power, 
uh, uh, and the role of the West in the idea of manifest destiny. So in playing with, a, with a Jefferson's idea that land was essential for the growth of democratic institutions, the idea of, 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 of the West essentially played into that too. And it's during this time where you see a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of famous uh, paintings uh, come into, uh, uh, being, being produced in the uh, 1830s, 1840s, which portray the West as this, as this majestic, uh, wild, yet somehow in inviting type of place for everybody to go check out. So whether it's the uh, mountains, uh, the, the trees, whether it's uh, streams and rivers, wildlife, deer, uh, 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 the, the bison population. In other words, artists of the time in the, what's called the early national period really portrayed nature and the West as this majestic, romantic type of place. You contrast that with paintings that were done of nature back in the late 18th century in the 1770s, 1780s, 1790s, and nature is seen as dark, evil, sinister. There's uh, devils and goblins and dragons, uh, all kinds of uh, nasty stuff. Uh, if you ever, if, if you go to, to the uh, Detroit Institute of Arts, the uh, famous art museum in Detroit, there's excellent example, excellent examples which show you how the portrayal of the West, of nature, of 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 of, 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 of the outdoors. Uh, it's a dark, sinister tone in the late 18th century, but if you see some of the paintings from the early to mid-19th century, much diff different different tone, and uh, some of the readings in the uh, U.S.-Mexico War stuff uh, definitely touch upon that. So after you read William Weeks' article, then take a look at Lecture Outline 14. Lecture Outline 14 essentially shows you how all these forces collide. Uh, everything just comes together at the uh, uh, perfect time, the perfect storm, so to speak, and then uh, these forces collide and uh, lead to the uh, to the war between the United States and, and, and United States and uh, United, United States and, and Mexico. So, uh, so of course we get the beginnings of the U.S. Mexico Mexico War. That's what Outline 14 uh, Outline 14 uh, illustrates. <clears throat> okay. Now, after you check out the uh, after you check out Outline 14, go ahead and take a look at the Between the Conquest readings, in which the readings include some of the uh, primary documents, the primary ideas that were that, were, that, uh, that, that, that were coming out at the time. So, among the readings in Between the Conquest, uh, Mike Ornelas has for us uh, President Polk's war message to Congress, in which he basically makes the claim that uh, that in an ambush that took place in disputed territory between the uh, Rio Nuez and the Rio Grande, that little strip in the South part of Texas, roughly in the areas around where, say, uh, Corpus Christi, Brownsville, Harlingen, M M M McAllen, th those places, that's the uh, disputed area between the U.S. and Mexico. Polk believed that uh, American troops were, were, were killed on U.S., so, but it's disputed territory. It wasn't resolved as to who the territory belonged to, but Polk insisted that was American territory. Mexico insisted, no, that's our, our, our territory. So a little bit about that in the Between the Conquest reading. And also in the, uh, in the Between the Conquest readings, there's also John L. O'Sullivan, who was a political writer at the time. He t uh, <clears throat> O'Sullivan, we have the, uh, his uh, seminal, his influential piece about the idea of a uh, manifest destiny. Okay, let's go to end the shift gears and talk about the war itself. Um, I have another, uh, another uh, PDF outline, uh, outline there for you. It's called the Early Stages of the U.S.-Mexico War. So, uh, so, so check that out. That gives you a sense of who the uh, major players were, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, some of the main uh, military engagements, whether it was some of the early battles like Resaca de la Palma and Palo Alto in Texas, and then on into some of the early, uh, early fighting in Mexico, especially in places like, like Monterrey, which was one of the key, <coughs> excuse me, which was one of the, the key uh, battlegrounds in northern Mexico before the uh, fighting shifted into the interior of Mexico by summer of 1847. That, of course, is where General Scott uh, and, the, and the U.S. Army uh, goes in for the kill, much like Cortes did about 300 years uh, earlier when he, when, he went in, uh, when he went into the Aztec and for Tenochtitlan. Uh, <clears throat> Scott and his men essentially follow the same path uh, as Cortes as they make their way into, uh, in toward Mexico City. So all of uh, uh, so uh, some of that is described in the uh, uh, U.S. Mexico War outline, and there's also a PowerPoint program called the U.S. Mexico War 1846-1847. So take a look at that PowerPoint program because that gets into more detail about some of the uh, key battles which take place, like Monterrey and where General Taylor comes in. So there were two main generals going on. Uh, uh, 
who saw the earth, who saw the action in uh, in Mexico Mexico itself. Yeah, General Taylor in the north, and then General Scott uh, a little bit later on. So the PowerPoint program gives you a sense of who those men are and what made these two men, uh, even though they were both on the same team, very very uh, different in terms of personality, style, tactics, that type of thing. So all of that is is looked at in the 1846-1847 uh, U.S.-Mexico War PowerPoint program. Now. Um, um, Mexico, while, while that was the main theater of action, of course, there were other theaters of action. There was, a, uh, there was action taking shape in New Mexico and, of course, in California, too. So I want you to now take a look at the events happening in California with the uh, program called the U.S.-Mexico War in California. And here we meet people like, uh, like, like Commodore Robert Stockton of the U.S. Navy, um, uh, the Army Captain uh, the Army Captain John C. Fremont, one of the more notorious and controversial characters in uh, military in American military history, and then we had some of the people on the California side. These were the Mexican Californians who were fighting against the uh, uh, the uh, Yankee uh, in invaders, Los 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 Gringos. Uh, we have people like Andres Pico, one of the famed uh, California la uh, Lancers, and uh, all these guys are, are all these guys are mentioned in the uh, U.S. Mexico War uh, in California PowerPoint program. Okay, uh, I'm quickly going over, going over the information right here I have here on the uh, 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 on the uh, on the module uh, overview. So let me see if there's anything I need to mention right, right now, real quickly before I go on to tell you what, what the next uh, uh, step in the readings and and uh, and, uh, and and articles are. Okay, well let me just go ahead and, and, and uh, let me just go ahead and uh, and, uh, and and keep the uh, and, and keep the conversation going because at the end of the U.S. Mexico War. There, it was supposed to be a period in which uh, uh, the uh, the new citizens, and now we have the new Mexican-American people. So if you're wondering where the term Mexican-American comes in terms of uh, uh, in terms of what it means to be the Mexican-American people, and then, of course, Chicano becomes more of a term when we get into the uh, 1960s, after World, after World War II and the beginnings of the Chicano movement, of course. I get into a lot more of those topics in the 142 class. But in terms of who the first historical Mexican-American people are, these are the people who were living in previously Mexican territories, California, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, uh, uh, other parts of the American Southwest, who once don't want up, who now they're living in, in, in U.S. territory, and many of them did, uh, opt, opted to uh, stay in that territory and become U.S. citizens. So these were people who were uh, Mexican in, in birth, in, uh, in religion, in culture, but in terms of, of politics, now they're American citizens. So hence we get the first, uh, what's called the, you might say, the creation generation of the Mexican-American people. It's those people who one day were living in, say, uh, Mexican San Diego, uh, but then, uh, but then, after Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was assigned in early 1848, and then ratified by both the U.S. Senate and the Mexican Congress in May of 1848, now within a matter of a, within a, 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 a manner of a weeks, a few months, now they were now U.S. citizens. So. Uh, uh, so in between the conquests, and, uh, there's a section on the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, so, uh, so, so, so read that, and then I'll read the section about the Protocol of Querétaro, also in the Between the Conquests book. Uh, interesting, the Protocol of Querétaro was a very confusing uh, uh, type of, of situation. It had to do with the issue of uh, land, grants that, uh, uh, land grants that were in Texas, previous Mexican land grants, but, uh, but these land grants were essentially nullified once Texas became an independent nation and then became part of the United States in 1845. Uh, what the protocol addressed was, well, who actually owns these lands? Do these land, lands be, belong to the longtime Tejanos who lived in, uh, in uh, Texas for many years before the uh, Americans came in, or these lands now be uh, in the hands of the Anglo miner, I'm sorry, the Anglo ranchers, the Anglo landowners, the ones who came in afterward, after people like uh, Stephen F. Austin were coming into uh, into Texas in the 1820s. So that's what the Protocol of Querétaro addresses. But the gist of it, the main point of the protocol is that this goes to show you that as early as the uh, late 1840s, the United States government at the time 
Uh, and keep on this still turn this still during the uh, administration of uh, of uh, of President James Polk and the Secretary of State James uh, Bu Buchanan, who proved to be one of the most uh, awful presidents in U.S. U.S. history because he was the one who, in essence, uh, gave the uh, uh, gave the store away in terms of uh, leading up to the U.S. Civil War in the late 1850s. Basically, once Buchanan left and Lincoln comes in, that's when the nation was falling apart at the seams. Buchanan's uh, uh, I had to do essentially. Well, well, uh, well, Abe. Uh, sorry, but I'm going back to my home in Pennsylvania. So uh, you take care of the country now. It's, it's all yours. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, Buchanan was that that type of, of person, and it seemed that as Secretary of State to it, James Polk, he seemed to show those types of characteristics. In other words, my my point is, by the late 1840s, even though ostensibly there were treaties, there was a treaty signed to ensure uh, peace and uh, uh, good relations between the U.S. and Mexico and protection of uh, the new Mexican-American citizens now living in American territory, the Puerto of Querétaro, will begin to uh, show a pattern that uh, that on, on, on paper, Mexicans have rights, Mexican-Americans have rights, but in practice, it was a far, far different story. And uh, and again, these are topics to get into more detail in the 142 class. Okay, and then after you read uh, those sections, then go ahead and check out the readings by Maithi Ro uh, uh, Ma Ma Rojas and, and Mike Ornelas himself. So uh, read what Rojas and, and Ornelas have because uh, these readings elaborate more upon the difficulties Chicanos would face in the later years after this Mexico War. So basically a lot of the writings that Rojas and, uh, and Ornelas have are more lead-ins into, uh, into uh, uh, what's going to be covered, what I cover, especially in the 142 class. <clears throat> All right. Now, <clears throat> while, while, while these readings and some of the items I mentioned illustrate more the, the, the issues that, that would face the uh, Mexican-American people, uh, the final stages of the, uh, of, of the readings and programs uh, for, this, uh, for this module for, for the week look at the problems that would face the United States. So in other words, now we're getting into the, what I call the crisis of the 1850s, um, or the point of, uh, the point of no, no return. In other words, even though the 1850s was ostensibly supposed to be a period in which, well, the U.S. now has all this land from Mexico, uh, manifest destiny has been, been achieved, uh, we're a United Nation, blah, 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 everything's going to be fine and dandy, honky dory, right? Not exactly. That wouldn't re that necessarily be, uh, prove to be the case. So, uh, in lecture outline 15 and in the crisis of the 1850s PowerPoint program, these things give you a better picture of the factors that brought the nation to the brink of catastrophe. All the nation's political institutions, uh, whether it was Congress, the presidency, and the Supreme Court, uh, could not effectively deal with the situation of the question of slavery. <clears throat> Now, in other words, they couldn't really reconcile what to do about slavery and the rapid expansion of the, of the country. Okay, what area becomes a free? All right, California, that's a free state. No slaves there. Uh, now, people in New Mexico and, uh, and, and Arizona, well, we'll let you people that, that decide. Your territory is now. You're not a sl state yet. But if you want slaves in, in there, uh, you guys can decide a, 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 upon that. Basically, it's a hodgepodge a collection, a, a mishmash, mishmash, whatever, whatever term you want to use, of uh, one policy after another trying to deal with a crisis that seems to pop up every, uh, every few years. So that's what the 1850s was like. One thing would pop up, Congress would say something, the president would say something else, the Supreme Court stepped in, maybe that solved the problem. Another problem popped up, and you get the idea. It was just one thing after another, and this continued all the way into the... Uh, all the way into the end of the 1850s, uh, the political parties uh, were splitting, were falling apart at the at the seams. The Democrats, the, the the Whig Party, the Whig Party was the precursor to the modern Republican Party. The Whigs were the ones who uh, who came into the the White House in 1848 after James Polk uh, left the White House. And interestingly, uh, the one who won in 1848 was General Taylor, who of course was a hero for the U.S.-Mexico War in Monterrey in 18 uh, back in 1846. So interestingly, how uh, uh, how politics interferes with military and vice versa. And then we see this result happening in 1848. Uh, other events happening in the uh, in the 1850s, of course, you have the infamous uh, Dred Scott decision, which essentially says that slaves are property, they don't have a, a, a human rights, and the states can't dictate where you can take your, where you can take your, your, your property. 
And then you had the uh, uh, double whammy of uh, John Brown's actions in both Kansas and also in Harper's Ferry, Virginia. And then, of course, the election of 1860, in which Abraham Lincoln becomes president and the South Car Carolinians who had been causing problems for many years. In fact, they caused uh, Jackson problems, as we saw in the Andrew Jackson film last week. South Carolina secedes, and the rest is history. We know what happens a after that. The dominoes finally fall. And uh, those dominoes, of course, are the U.S. Civil War. So finish off the module by looking at Lecture Outline 16 and then the program on the, on the Civil War. And all of those things, uh, all, all of those things, uh, uh, Bring about the uh, bring about the end of the module, but also the topics of for for uh, for, for the class, uh, both the uh, the PowerPoint program and the uh, uh, and the and, and the lecture outline give you a, a wide sense of some of the main political and uh, military players going on at the at the time. So of course we have people like uh, like Robert E. Lee, who and of course his name has been, has been popping up again in the news in the wake of the uh, South Carolina tragedy. But then you have the people on the Union side, Ulysses S. Grant, William T. Sherman, Philip Sheridan, and of course Lincoln uh, him, him himself. And uh, I think the point of, uh, of, of finishing off the class with the U.S. Civil War is, is that when the Civil War ended in 1865, and then, uh, and then uh, with uh, the out the outlaw the outlawing of, of, of slavery and the uh, uh, restoration of political rights to former African American slaves. That's where you have the uh, the thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth uh, amendments. What the Civil War did was by uh, creating the political uh, uh, climate for the uh, for the enactment of the thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth amendments. This, in essence, uh, uh, paved the way for the idea of equal rights, equal protection for for not just African Americans, but but for, but for all people, people from all walks of life, of uh, uh, not just African Americans, but later on uh, uh, Chicanos, uh, Native Americans, uh, w w women, and now in modern times with uh, with the uh, with the uh, LGBT uh, uh, situation and the uh, recent Supreme Court rulings about the uh, whole same uh, same sex marriage uh, issue, what the Civil War essentially did was I. I think it consolidated or helped to uh, uh, consolidate a lot of the ideas that were talked about back in Philadelphia with the Constitution back in 1787. So <clears throat> those I ideas, uh, you might say, that were talked about in Philadelphia, uh, they, really, they really weren't put into practice that, that, that firmly. But when the U.S. Civil War happened, and then you had the, uh, these, the 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, Amendments, that created... Uh, that in essence created more of a, a social and political and legal framework for others to come on the scene and say, well, you know something, um, um, uh, the African Africans American African Americans were protesting all these Jim Crow laws in the South and using these uh, 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 using the, these ideas. Uh, we as Chicanos, we don't like what's happening in Texas with all these issues about uh, what's happening with a uh, uh, jury selection. Uh, 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 have, having to sit, in, having to sit in, in the balcony for the movies with all these uh, signs that say uh, "No dogs allowed, no Mexicans allowed." We don't like to like that stuff. We're, we're going to protest about that. The 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments essentially gave the framework uh, for a lot of these movements, and, and these are things which I get into a lot more detail in the uh, 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 in the 142 class. And then over time, of course, uh, the, the women's mo movement, uh, and then uh, Native Americans, and of course the LGBT community, uh, LGBT community, who really first started mobilizing for uh, for uh, their rights in the late 1960s uh, during all that time of turbulence and and, and, and chaos uh, in the uh, uh, in the uh, Vietnam war, war period. So my point is that what the U.S. Civil War does for Chicano studies is, is that the end of the Civil War. Um, with the uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, amendments being enacted after that, finally gave the, uh, uh, shall we say, social and political and I'd say legal uh, context for the origins, for the development of, of things like Mexican American studies, African American studies, Native American studies, or or, or as they call, or as as a term is applied in uh, over at Mesa College, Chicano Chicano studies. So. Uh, it's easy just to sit back and say, oh, Professor, why do we have to talk about the Civil War? This doesn't really ma make sense to us. Uh, um, uh, 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 Grant and, uh, and, and Sherman, how does this uh, connect to, to, to what's happening here? It's not so much uh, that the events on, on, on the battlefield connect to, uh, uh, connect to uh, uh, 
Mexican American studies or Chicano studies, but it's the aftermath which is significant. It's the political and legal aftermath which is which is important. And these are some of the things that uh, that uh, that I think uh, uh, Michael Nellis addresses in his between the con in the between the Congress readings, and of course other readings uh, uh, which I have for the 142 class really illustrate that. So uh, so so with that, I felt it was important that the U.S. Civil War would be the uh, <clears throat> would be the last place in which we uh, finish off the class. And sadly, uh, I couldn't really get into a lot more about the war itself because, uh, because of course, the time constraints and, of course, the context of the class. If this is the history, uh, I think it's 100 that with the U.S., the early U.S., then I'd definitely spend a lot more time about the war itself. But I felt it was important to finish off the class with the war, look at not just the military component, but, uh, but try to see into the future with respect to the political and the legal uh, ramifications afterward, uh, and, uh, and that basically provides a good starting point for the origins of, uh, uh, for the origins, for, uh, for the political space in which, in which uh, people later on down the line, like Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Corky Gonzalez, um, and many, many others who, of course, became the early heroes of the Chicano movement, uh, come to the forefront. So my contention is this, if it hadn't been for the events of the Civil War, and the uh, political uh, events soon afterward, uh, that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't create the space for the early for the early stages uh, and the uh, and, and the later stages of what we now know today as the as the uh, uh, Chicano Studies Movement and uh, and hence with the Chicano Studies Move up uh, I'm sorry the Chicano Movement and then in the aftermath of the Chicano Movement of course we get Chicano Studies programs and here at Southwest and of course we have the Mexican American Studies of classes. All right, and with that, that takes care of that. So uh, normally I would say uh, that takes care of everything from here at the uh, French Valley studio, the French Valley headquarters. Uh, but of course, I'm actually here in, I guess you might say, my uh, uh, Las Vegas studio. But it's only for one more day. I'm definitely heading back uh, to uh, 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 toward the end of the heading back to Ontario coming up uh, tomorrow. All right, so that's it. That, uh, that's going to be my last uh, video for the, uh, at least for at least for the, for the modules, uh, in terms of the readings. Uh, uh, mo most likely there'll, there'll, there'll be one, one final video in which I say good goodbye to everybody before the uh, uh, before I, I, I start turning in all the grades and all that fun stuff. All right, so that's it from here. That's it from uh, Las Vegas, the Nevada, and uh, I'll talk to you guys again uh, again soon. Uh, back from the uh, French Valley headquarters.